afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, I'm very pleased you're all able to uh, join us this afternoon um, as part of the launch of the new speaker series here at the University of Manchester. Uh, we're really pleased to be um, running this series, which is called Entrepreneurs of Manchester. Um, we're going to try and bring some um, significant entrepreneurs to Manchester, and I hope you agree that we've got quite a gem um, to start the series today. So I'm really glad we've got a full house to be able to listen to our guest um, this evening. Um, let me just say to you from a housekeeping perspective, um, I'm not expecting any fire alarm tests. So if we do hear a fire alarm, we'll leave the building please, by the staircase, out to the ground floor. Um, at the end of this event, there's some refreshments served in the foyer, so please do stay and network and get to meet some of the Enterprise Centre team who are here this evening. I'm Lynn Shepherd, I'm Director of the Enterprise Centre, um, and I'm really pleased um, to welcome you all here this evening. So, I know you haven't come to listen to me, so let me start by introducing um, someone who I hope will become a real good friend of the Enter Enterprise Centre, he's certainly a friend of the University of Manchester, and that's Neil MacArthur. Neil is on the Board of Governors here at the University, but he's here not to talk necessarily about that today, but to talk about his journey um, when he started a national telecoms company, which became a significant player in the marketplace. So, without anything else, let me introduce Neil MacArthur. Neil, over to you. It does often get described as a gem. Good evening, good evening, and uh, what a fantastic uh, turnout. I see uh, about 70 billion businesses before me. Um, it's great. Well, we've titled this Talk to All the New Kids on the Block, but really it's about enterprise and why you folks should all go and start a business uh, when you've escaped from this fine university. And then said, I'm governor of the university, but actually, governance is the furthest thing you want from your mind when you start a business. So, um, uh, the, the, the talk was originally in three parts, but uh, it's grown to four while <laughs> in the last half hour. So I'm going to do a very brief history about the, the sort of journey that I've been on the last 30 years, because there's some interesting points in that. Um, a little bit about what I think makes an entrepreneur, because it's only looking back that you think of things that, you know, what is it, what are the characteristics of an entrepreneur, and that would probably, you could ask yourself some of those questions, you know, have I got those characteristics or am I like to acquire them or whatever. Some basic principles of business and then really I'm going to finish by just saying why you should all stay in Manchester and start your business uh, in, in, in this great city. Um, so the first bit really about um, the, the, the history, you know, who he's talked of. I mean, not that many people know. And that's why I always use the phrase with the new kids on the block. People still think we're a bit of an offshoot of BT or something. Uh, it's actually a FTSE uh, 250 company now. Uh, it's got just under 2 billion in revenue, about 3,500 3, staff in the UK, um, and we've got about 20% of the market share uh, of UK voice and broadband, uh, and, and an increasing number of uh, TV customers. We've got about 4 million customers in the UK. So between ourselves, BT, Sky and Virgin, we really represent the telecoms industry on the fixed line of broadband, and then of course as the, the mobile providers. Uh, but for me, this all went back to, I, I was still at 16, so uh, with, with some GCSEs, and I ended up doing an apprenticeship in the nuclear industry, which is quite far removed from the telecoms industry, trust me. Um, but that, that's where I met my original business partner, Graham. Um, we've, we escaped from, from that after four years, and we went to university, as it happens, I went to Wessex University with telecommunications, because it was very close to BT's research uh, centre down there. And then when we came back, Graham and I decided that we would start a business. And um, then I went back into the nuclear industry. Um, and we ended up entering an enterprise competition here in Manchester. And I found myself in MBS uh, in 1981 on a small enterprise course, receiving bite-sized uh, um, courses on, on finance and marketing. That's the type of thing that, that Lynn's just described that you get from the uh, enterprise centre at, at MBS today, really. Um, and we, uh, it was there that actually I met a guy who really encouraged me uh, to write my resignation. I was just explaining to Lynn that actually I wrote my resignation from being a fellow out in, in MBS in June 1981. And, um, and we started this business. In those days we didn't have things called incubators and, and business startup units and all the rest of the thing. We actually started in a, in a shed. Um, 
And we started an engineering business, and we spent 15 years building up that engineering business. And it became very substantial. They had about 200 staff, about 20 million turnover. Um, but actually, we realized after 15 years that engineering is a really tough business to start. And there's a really a big message in, in, in here a bit later on. Um, and, and we sort of decided at that point we'd started the wrong business, which is a bit late 15 years in. So I had this, this really defining moment in 1995 where um, the nuclear industry wasn't going anywhere. And as you know now, we're reading the papers, it's coming back. But at the time, it really, the government really weren't for investing in it. And so we decided that we'd have to reinvent the business. So we, um, we spent a year out uh, with looking at what kind of business that we could start. And it's then that we started to think about, if you're starting a business again, what business would you start? And that's a real question for you folks, if you do decide to start a business. Start the right one, think about what kind of business you want to start. And there's some points we can perhaps make on that a bit later on. So why did you choose telecommunications? The first question, it wasn't exactly close to the, to the, um, to the nuclear industry. And although I've done a degree in it, that wasn't actually the driver. The driver was that in, 90, in the early 90s, we had deregulation in the UK. Because up until then, we only had um, two companies, BT and this company called Cable Miles at the time. So the government decided that two companies with a duopoly won't do, we're going to deregulate. Um, there's a huge amount of technology in the telecommunications industry, and it started growing like crazy. I've just described three major disruptions going on. And if you're going to start a business, start one where there's disruptions are going on, and you're pushing them and open your own. So we kicked off this 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 business to business telco, which was called Opal at the time. Um, and we were actually a bunch of techies, so I'm an engineer, uh, and we had some really, really good engineers. We brought a load over from the nuclear industry and we sort of figured out how telecoms works and, and started thinking of new things to do in telecoms. But we actually were pretty crummy at sales and marketing. So we did a joint venture with a company that was really good at sales and marketing and didn't have any technology. And, um, and that really was the point at which it started to, the company started to grow. Um, by 1999, this company had got to about uh, 100 million of revenue. Um, and we were just uh, in, in this technology bubble that was going on. And um, we were encouraged to float this business. And some idiot valued this company at something like 250 million pounds. Uh, I'm sorry, it's revenue about 25 million at the time. Somebody valued this at 250 million pounds and they hadn't made a bean. But in the dot com boom before March 2000, you couldn't do anything wrong. By March 2000, you couldn't do anything right. The ability to raise capital went from being you know, a drop in the ocean, absolutely no trouble at all, to being impossible in the space of about two weeks. And we were on the roadshow, we'd raised about 30 million of capital, we were sat in Edinburgh Airport when the market turned. Uh, and, and the dot-com gone boom became a bust on the 10th of March, uh, 2000. Um, this was a real problem for us because we were losing money like crazy, although the business was growing. And, um, and actually, we ended up, we thought we'd got to have to go and see some venture capitalists, and we didn't like the deals. And whenever you folks meet venture capitalists in your business career, you won't like them either. Um, and, you know, people call them venture capitalists for good reason. Uh, but they do have a part to play, and they, they looked essential at that time. Um, actually, our bank manager rescued us, and this guy lent us 20, 26 million pounds with a five million pound fee, and we only had eight million pounds of security. Right, trust me, that would not happen today. You'd stand a cat in house chance to that. So we ended up with 31 million of debt, um, and that was only for 12 months. But by that time, we knew the business would be cash flow positive, it'd be that positive. And it was, and that allowed us to keep the equity together, and it allowed the business to grow to about 100 million uh, of revenue. Because we'd failed to get it on the stock market, and, and, and at the time, you just couldn't float anything following the dot-com bus. Um, we, were, we were caught in um, a guy called Charles Dunstan, who ran the car phone um, warehouse group, for the, and he was a Charles Dunstan now, and a very, very successful business, business guy. And he wanted to be very, very good sales and marketing, and he wanted to get into this market and actually didn't have the technology. So we, we, we worked out this merger, and, and we took the company into the car phone group, and we renamed it TalkTalk. Talk. So that's how we got there. And, and, and we launched uh, very cheap voice calls on the back of our spare capacity in our business networks so that we could launch residential voice calls 
Um, but where, where it really started to take off was in 2006, where uh, broadband was starting to develop, and uh, we were very keen to build a broadband network. At the time, as an engineer, I was absolutely opposed to the way it was being done in the UK, and there was a lot of pressure on the board to get on with it. And we absolutely had a eureka moment from the technology guys, and, um, uh, uh, and we came up with a, 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 a way of technically building a converged voice network. I'd like to think it was our idea, but it wasn't actually. We stole it off BT. Um, it's a piece of work they did and decided not to carry on with it, but we saw it was brilliant. And so we took it and, and refined it. And, um, and what that allowed us to do was put broadband with voice in a bundle and line rental in a bundle. And effectively, at half the price of broadband overnight in the UK. So we have got no broadband customers at all in the UK. And within a month, we were signing up 50,000 customers a week. This was a bit of a problem because we could only put 25,000 a week on the network. So things weren't going very well uh, for us because uh, customers were getting very cross and angry. And I don't know if you've ever seen a program called Watchdog. Um, so my boss ended up on the TV and watched up, and uh, if, ever, if you ever see Charles Dunstan, you ever meet the guy, he's the most charismatic guy you're going to meet. You know, when you meet him, you shake his hand, you'll like the guy. And actually, he's, he's a very, very genuine guy. And he went on Watchdog, and, uh, and Anne, um, what do I know now, Anne, and um, it's Robinson here, yeah, around Watchdog, started to rip into Charles. And, and he just stood there and he went, um, what can I say? We thought we were doing a great thing, making broadband free for everybody in the country, you know, allowing access to people who couldn't afford broadband, and we got it wrong. We just completely underestimated it, and I'd like to apologise to everybody out there. He came off the programme, the sales went up. It was just a fantastic free advert on TV for us. And, um, and the business just took off. Um, what we'd also done, because we disrupted this marketplace with technology, um, we made it almost impossible for anybody else to make any money in broadband. And the only people that could survive actually was BT because of its capital base. So all those other small broadband suppliers, and the two biggest at the time were AOL and Tiscally, failed. And we must have bought nine companies, uh, and we spent 900 million pounds consolidating the market. Uh, and, and the last two we bought were AOL UK and Tiscally. Um, so by, well, that gave us just over 20% of the UK market in about three years flat. Um, we got a lucky break there because when we bought um, Tiscally, they had a, a, a very, very small TV business, broadband TV business, and we knew nothing about TV. And we very nearly closed this down because it was losing an awful lot of money. But we realised they got some great technology. We kept that business, and later on uh, we joined the New View Consortium, which is uh, the consortium of broadband uh, suppliers of BT um, that sells BBC ITV Channel, 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 Channel 3, Channel 4, who've produced what is effectively a souped up version of iPlayer that goes into the UV box. And so we've ended up going from narrowband voice to broadband to TV um, without catching much of our breath really. Um, and it just keeps moving. And that's why I say with the new kids on the block, because we keep bouncing from, from one thing to the other. Um, so, just to finish off on this, the future for us really where we are. At the moment, we're, we're laying fibre around York to see if we can push up the marketplace and, and lay a gigabit of speed into, into 20,000 homes to financially prove that model. And we're building what we call an inside out mobile network. Um, so, we, we've had quite a journey, and I still work in the company because it's just such fun, and the people I work with are just, uh, are just so fantastic. And, um, you know, it, it's just been great. So, that's sort of how we've got here, and I spend my time these days at the university and, and speaking to people like South and going around it, and um, you know, I've arguably got the best job in talk to her because I have no staff whatsoever and I can go dabble in all sorts of uh, interesting technical things. Um, I've got a, a bit of a pace because we've got a basic hour and we want to have a good time for sort of Q&A. Um, so on to part two, um, which is really what we're here, I think, is what actually makes um, what makes an entrepreneur? Mm. It's a good question. I think it's sort of in you. So perhaps you look back on your early years and think, was a fairly enterprising at school? Am I enterprising in my general, general uh, my, you know, my, my general life? You know, um, 
For me, I think it's about tenacity. You know, you never gave, never given up, you know. Uh, I was a natural academic. And I can remember going to university and fighting my way through it. Uh, and, uh, and that's the point, really. And, and, and I know that when the businesses that we started got threatened, and they did get threatened at all times, you know, I became a very angry and a very, very focused person. And I think that's a key thing. Are you capable of getting yourself, not only physically angry with your neighbour, but into a position where you're so focused and driven, you know, you can keep going? Because the, the good entrepreneurs that I know, um, you know, are focused and they're driven and they've got lots of characteristics of self-belief uh, and enthusiasm and drive, you know. And, uh, and it's worth saying, really, that if, if business was very easy, of course, everybody would do it, you know, running a business or starting a business. Um, it's not. It's actually very, very hard. Um, it's very rewarding, um, and it, but it is actually very, very hard because you know you don't know everything. You know you'll know you'll know something because you wanted to start a business, but you don't know everything, and that makes it extremely, extremely hard. These days, you know, I work in a business and that's, that's got skills coming out of its ears, but actually we find it hard to do things now because we move slowly. And um, actually, when you're a very small business. It's much easier to do things because you're much more, much more agile. Um, and it's fair to say that there have been some tremendous highs and lows in my career. Um, and that's what sort of makes it really, because without the lows, you wouldn't really enjoy the highs. So if you've been in a deep trough and you're absolutely in it, boy, do you enjoy getting out of it. The trouble is being an entrepreneur, you sort of forgot you were in it. And uh, you're just on the top when you just bottle off into the next trough again. And, um, and then you've just got to figure out how you get out of it again and you're into the next time. And there's a characteristic of, of the human race, actually, and that's when you look back, you tend to remember the good times, not the bad times. And that's just as well if you're going to be an entrepreneur, because when I look back, I think of some of the great things that happened to us, and I have to think really hard about some of the terrible things that happened to us, um, and, and, and the, the depressions and the lows, and you know, pulling yourself through those, really. Um, and perhaps something worth um, just saying to you, um, I don't know how, how many of you know about the, the UK National Lottery or whether you play it, but the basic rules of it, as I understand, um, if you get six numbers, you become a multi-millionaire. So you've just got to pick six numbers. That's all it is. Of course, you've got to pick the right six. Okay? And if you only get five of them, you only win 10 quid. Okay. So if you get six, you win 10 million. And if you get five, you get 10 quid. Well, that's what starting a business is like. So if anybody's in this room now who think I've got this great business idea, okay, you'd be sat there thinking, I've got the six numbers. And most entrepreneurs I've met who are gonna start a business, start with that belief, I've got six numbers. It's my idea, it's world changing. I am gonna make a fortune and that's it. And I can just say to you now, you haven't got six numbers, okay? Because <laughs> I've not got six numbers. I didn't have six numbers at all. Charles Dunson thought he got six numbers. Now, I know Charles really well, and I think he's a better entrepreneur than me. I think I had three numbers looking back, and I think he had four. <laughs> yeah. right. So who had the other two and the three? Well, I was very fortunate. I had a business partner called Graham who uh, complimented me completely. He's not very technical. Uh, he's a great people person. Uh, he, he, he used to look after the back end of the business and make sure everything worked in the business. You know. So along comes Graham, and Graham had got one and a half numbers. So I've still got four and a half numbers, but I'm not sat there thinking I've got four and a half numbers, because for self-belief, you've got six numbers, haven't you? But in practice, you have. And then along comes Frank, who's our finance director. And we employed Frank, we're a few years in by this time, trouble along, and you end up with your six numbers. And once you've got your six numbers, you're away. Woof. In Charles's case, he had a finance guy, a guy called David Ross, who joined him. Um, Charles is a great salesman, you know, great retailer. He, he had a guy who was a great finance guy, and between them, they got six numbers. Okay. So just think about that. Think about the skills that you haven't got, not just the ones that you have got. Sure, your idea is great, but there'll be a whole lot of skills that will come on to that, that you haven't got. Um, some other things, really. If you fail, if you fail, if your business fails. And there's a good chance that anybody starting a business here, it will fail. A lot of businesses fail, it doesn't matter, just have another go. You are all so young, and I was about, I guess, a little bit older, I was about 25 when I started 
business, but you are so young that if your business fails, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, bounce back, have another go. Right? And people like Alan Sugar and Richard Ransom, they had businesses that failed. You know, Alan Sugar had some shocking businesses. Absolutely shocking businesses. People only remember the one they were successful at, for sure. And, and, and I can tell you that before Talk Talk, um, when we started our telecoms businesses, we actually started three businesses. We conveniently don't talk about the two that didn't work. <laughs> we just talk about the ones that worked, because you remember the good times, not the bad. But actually, we had two other businesses. One of them was a small company called The Quist, and it actually did what PayPal is today. But it was just too early in its, its life, and it was micropayments on the net before the net had really got going, and we couldn't make it work. And we tried like hell, it was a great idea, fantastic idea, but it didn't work, and it failed, and we ran out of money. And we had another business that was in Telecom's accounting system that also failed, okay? But the third one didn't, and we all remember the third one. So, you know, that doesn't matter, we wrote those two off. But you wouldn't invest in a business thinking it was gonna fail. So we didn't really think it was gonna fail, we just didn't know which one was gonna succeed. Um, but one did, and that's where I was today, I suppose. Um, on the other thing, on, on enterprise. Enterprise is very difficult to teach. I'm sure we're not there. It is something that's very difficult to teach. So if you go into an MBS and somebody says, right, we're gonna teach you to an, uh, be an entrepreneur. They're gonna struggle right now. It's got to be in you. You've really got to want to do it. If you don't really, really, really want to do it, want to start that business, put that effort in, and, and get the highs and the lows, then you, you better actually just get yourself well educated and go get a job in a, in a big company and maybe rethink about it a bit later. But it's so much easier to do it when you're 20 than when you're 40. Because if you get to 40 and you've got a, a family, the chances of you of starting a business now are, are dramatically reduced. The risks are much higher and you're less likely to do it. And if you get it wrong the first time, you haven't got that recovery time. At the moment, you guys have got so little to lose, probably economically, if you start a business in France. So you just as well do it now, get on with it, and you're going to learn a lot. And if the business fails, then you start another, but you'll be a lot longer to the second one. And probably the second idea is better than the first one, or it better have to be, because you'll fail again. Um, you know, and, and, and just my bounce back. So when it comes to teaching, if you're standing there saying, you know, teaching entrepreneurship. You know, I can say that I spent those two weeks I spent at MBS in 1981. I really, really value it because when I walked straight in, they gave me some really good lessons. I did things like financial management, management accounting, corporate finance, marketing, and later on, when we became a FTSE uh, 250 company, and we suddenly had all sorts of. Um, I guess governance and all sorts of um, investor relation meetings to attend to. I actually came back to MBS probably about um, I think, yeah, about eight years ago now, ten years ago, even, and did half an MBA just so I could get on top of the game again with some of the theory. So you can take some great things away from this university and from the enterprise centre. But they're not going to teach you to be entrepreneurs. Well, they can teach you about contract law. They can teach you about employment law. They can certainly teach you finance. Uh, really drill home. The financial management course, deal with financial management course. Business management course, yes, okay. Be a little bit careful when you talk, try and talk to you about people management skills, you know, things like that. Because uh, some skills are really difficult to teach. Negotiation, tremendously difficult thing to teach. It's sort of in your sales, you know, those people skills. How do you get on with people? Uh -huh. Very difficult to teach that. But you need to be aware, if you haven't got them, then you need somebody who has, and I have great, got great people skills. And over 25, 35 years, we built up a huge number of people. A lot are still with us because of the people skills that Graham had, that, 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 that he could look at people and, and, help, and help build a team. Um, certainly if you do a core degree at this university, and then you do an MBA, um, you're in a great position with lots of options. Start a business by all means, and if you don't, you're still in a great career option. So, you know, go and, go, go and snuff up a bit to MBS and see what you can, you can sneak off them, I'm sure, and, and, and get you on some of those, those courses, really. Um, just pressing on, um, there's many examples in society um, where small teams have really outsmarted big companies. We think we mugged BT, big time, make 20% of their market, and they were this big, and we were this big, and we stole 20% of their market. And I wonder what happened. Now they've come back at us 
you know, and they did, they, we got up to 23%, and they went and beat 3% off us. And we were like quite offended, really. So we're written and hard now on TV. You know, we're the fastest growing TV being in the business. They've gone and bought all these sports rights, you know, and what they've done, bought these all these big jumbo jets and, 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 and spent an awful lot of money, you know, and we've done a, an easy jet on them, you know, we've got some small nice new jets and we're just sort of creeping off at the low end of the traffic uh, and growing the business well. But there's lots of examples in society where small as out with TV. Um, James Dyson, look what he did to do that. Massive company, world's biggest vacuum supplier gets mugged by, you know, a, a technologist from, 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 from London, I think, um, on there. Um, what did Bill Gates do with Microsoft to IBM? So don't think, just because a big company's in there, it can't get mugged. Look for where it's weak, in its time, disruptions, technology, regulation. Look for changes and dynamics that will help you. And, um, and my chance with this great thing says, we zig when they zag. So when BT goes here, we go there. And when they follow us over there, we're over there. We just make sure we're where they're not. Okay. So we don't try and follow our competitors, we try and think, you know, where do we want to be in this marketplace? And the great thing about entrepreneurs is, of course, they think differently. So BT thinks as a collective, um, you know, uh, whereas, you know, in talk talk, it's very, you know, board meetings in talk talk used to be absolutely chaotic. They weren't structured at all. You know, minutes, not really minutes, take actions. You know, all this corporate structure stuff you learn at business school, uh, not talk talk. You know, you sit there with Charles and all that chat about things. It's all about being serious now because we've got a proper chief exec, it's a big company. And, you know, we reported our half year results today. So there's a whole lot of serious people in Talk Talk, but there's a few um, people like Charles and myself still knocking around the business trying to say how, we, how do we see where we are, you know. Um, and the thing is, you guys are the future. You are the future companies. So you've just got to go out there and, and really grasp this. Um, and even when you've made some cash, you will still, if you're an entrepreneur, you will still be driven. You know, I still bounce out of bed in the morning. I mean, I love coming to this university. I think it's incredible what's going on in this university. It, for me, I'm technology, so absolutely bubbling with technology. And it's easy, so, you know, if you can't be at this university and start a business, that's just, there's just so much going on, it's fantastic. And I've been talking about, about the city um, in, a, in a while, but um, there's so much going on there as well. Um, entrepreneurs, you've got to be half full, not half empty. So are you a half full person? When you look at your beer glass, okay, is it half full? You know, or is it half empty? It's a good question. So you've got some real principles. I start from, it will work. My wife always starts from, and God bless her, always starts from, it's going to break. And we're like, it's not, it's going to work. It will work. The bullet will miss me. <laughs> That's not to say I'm standing in front of the gun deliberately, but, you know, the car will not crash. <laughs> You know, I will get that sale, you know. We can do this, you know. And the one big thing is get the hype of the reality. It's something that I've been talking to in Manchester at the moment. So in a small business, make sure the hype's above the reality because you always want to look bigger than what you are. And, uh, and certainly Charles in Talk Talk has been absolutely fantastic at convincing people that we are bigger than we are. We're actually quite big now. Um, but in certain areas, you need to get the hype of the, of the reality. And of course, the full bottom, you've got to have the confidence, and that's back to that. It will work, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it work. So, trucking along, um, some quick principles of business. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the people are going to be the most important part of your business. You can't do it without people. You're not going to build much of a business unless you really understand people and relationships. And if you're not good at it, make sure you employ somebody who is. Look after your people big time. It's a big message. And three messages um, just I'd, li I'd, I'd like to take away today in this, and that's one of the first ones. People, people, and people, really important. Financially, cash flow is the biggest threat to your business, not profit. You know, that's what I walked out of MBS with in 1981. Never mind profit. Cash flow is what protects you out of business. Never forget it. Never, never, never forget it. It's cash flow, not profitability. Right. Here's another one. If you don't add value in what you're doing, don't expect to make a profit. Think about that deeply. So if you're going to make a product or design a service, make sure that you're adding some value, that people are going to value that service. 
Because if they don't, you will struggle to sell it and you will certainly struggle to make a profit in a, in a perfect market. And, and in the UK, the UK is a pretty perfect market for, 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 uh, for capitalism. You know, there isn't, the gaps don't last around for long. There's usually people like you around the country trying to jump into gaps to make a few bob. So make sure that whatever you do, it adds some value and people value it. Because if you do, then you'll be entitled to make a profit, and you will. And if you spot an arbitrage opportunity, right, and, and we've seen a few over the years, okay, remember arbitrage is usually disappearing in the perfect market. So if you see a quick angle or a buy and a sell opportunity where you're not having much value, but you can leverage a bit of profit because you've got a bit of knowledge, just be careful because arbitrage is do this a bit. The minute somebody else sees you with your nose in that trough, really enjoying making a profit, somebody else will want to get their nose in your trough. And <laughs> you've got to make absolutely sure that you know where you're going after, after that. So when you start your business, look for some disruption. Look for what's changing. Because if you're starting a business in an area that somebody's already servicing some kind of market, look for what's changing. We entered telecoms at the point where the government said, we want some deregulation here. We want, and we felt we needed to apply some technology. So look for, look for legal, regulatory disruption, look for technology disruption, um, growth market. Cranks, don't pick a market that's contracting. You know, that is hard work. Pick one that's growing, because your competitors have got to service that growth. And while they're servicing growth in their market, okay, they'll probably miss a few opportunities that you can duck in and, 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 and jump in and, and take. So what's happening to us in TV, BT and Sky haven't got the energy to come down to us. They're that busy selling everybody's sports for 50 quid a month. They're ignoring us selling stuff for 10 and 20 quid a month. Meanwhile, we're signing up twice as many customers a week as they are. You know, it's, if you think about Michael O'Leary and Ryanair, look what, look what Michael O'Leary does. He's not a particularly nice person, right? but he doesn't run a crummy airline. You know, if you study that business, he flies brand new aeroplanes. Okay? He gets you there on time. He cuts every cost out. It's just the customer service is a bit dodgy and you need to take your own buddies. But you know, it works, doesn't it? And the cash flow that business has created have been, have been staggering, you know. So he's found a really smart, smart feature. Um, when you start your business, really put some time in to think what business to start. It took us 15 years to figure out we started the wrong business, and that's a terrible, terrible, terrible position to be in. Um, you know, Start a business that's going to grow, not just steal somebody else's mature market. In other words, start the right business. You know, um, you know for, for us, changes in regulation got us 20% of somebody else's business and, and nicked two billion quid off BT top, you know, the top line. Um, good ideas. Um, you can be too early with a good idea. I gave the example of a company we started was a bit like PayPal. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember the Betamax and VHS technology, you're probably all too young, for video recorders. Betamax was a much better technology than VHS. VHS won. Sony beat everybody else with a poorer technology. So the best idea doesn't always guarantee that you're going to get the market. There's other things that can, that, that, that can do that. Um, if you form a business and you have a partnership, partnerships usually fail. Most partnerships statistically fail. But actually, it can be very lonely starting and running a business on your own. At some point, you are going to need help, whether it's employees, maybe it's a business partner. If it is a business partner or partners, make sure you can trust them, make sure you've got good agreements. Remember, you're going to be working with them for a long time. It's, you know, it's a bit like a marriage, really. You do not want it to end. It's a very costly experience if it ends. Make sure you've got a good partnership agreement, things like that. Look at the bigger picture. Don't squabble over bits and pieces. Take the bigger picture. When you've got partners in the business, you know, really take the bigger picture. And generally, pick your hills to fight on. You're running a business. If you fight every hill that you come across, you will exhaust yourself early. And whilst tactical moves are okay in any business, always keep in mind on what's my strategy. What's my strategy? You don't have to win every fight. You know, you haven't probably got the energy or the resources to win every fight. So make sure that you really pick your fights that you put the energy. And business has to be full. You've got to bounce out, you know, of an evening and bounce into the pub on a Friday night, like, you know, yes, you know, we survived another week and we took them on. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You've got to set your store out to get through a decade, not a year. So here I am 30 years on, 
you know, it's just it's consuming. You've got to get through each and every, each and every year. So you set your store lamp to sort of have that kind of, of energy, really. I always take some time for a cup of tea in the morning in the conservatory and think, what's important today? You, know, you can get really, really busy and take your eye off what's really important because something's distracting you. And you've still got to make a bit of time for some nice things to happen in your life as well. Because when you're up to your armpits in alligators and you're really struggling, you know, you've got to be able to go home, especially if you end up getting married and you've got a family, and you're going to walk through that front door and you've got to smile at the kids. Hi, you know, and you just have a shocking day at the office. Right? And I'm a living man from where I work and have done for 30 years. And there's been times when I've just had to park the car. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> And they're walking, ding! <laughs> so you've got to be able to separate your work from social life and make sure you enjoy it. So please don't start a business with your wife. It could be, it could be a real challenge. <laughs> um, okay. um, people make businesses. You know, I work with a fantastic chairman who can sell anything to anybody. Trust me, he's so charismatic. You walk into the room and shake his hand, you're trusted, you like him. You'd sign him, you know, it's just it's just great. You know, make sure you're working with people, you know, who are like that. And here's one for you. English law is about as good as it gets. So if you're gonna start a business in England, you can pretty much trust the law in this land. It's not perfect, but it's as good as it gets. If you're gonna start a business outside the UK, okay, be careful when abroad. Not everywhere, of course. The Americans would say they've got good laws as well, and, and, and I'm sure France and Germany would. But if you start in the UK, the law in this country is as good as it gets, yeah. and, and that's testament to the amount of commercial law, that, sorry, the commercial activity that's done around the world using English law. You know, I've been, you know, I've done work in the Middle East, off to the Bahamas on Friday to unscramble a shopping business position. You know, um, we've got lawyers in there as bent as you can believe it. And, you know, I've got deals in Spain, you know, with them lawyers. Italy, crikey, what a place to do business in. You know, it, and you think, it's, it's in Europe. So don't assume just because you're in the EU or some great place that law is going to be good. Be very careful that when you go out of your knowledge base on law. Um, number one, um, entrepreneurs are not very good CEOs. I am not a good CEO, I'm not a chairman. Okay, I think I'm a good entrepreneur, I'm a good engineer, I think I was a technical director, I was a good MD as a, a small business. I could not be a CEO of a FTSE 250 company. I, I worship the ground that our CEO works on. She's so brilliant. You know? She could start a business though. Well, she's fantastic. You know, so make sure that your strengths and as your business grows, the chances are you will have to step aside and bring other people in to run your business. And entrepreneurs who hang on to those reins too long watch their business flatten out and sometimes fail. Make sure, step aside at the right time, bring the skills in at the right time and grow. I'm just gonna give you some moral codes now because in 30 years time, and one of you is stood here, I just want you to think about this. Okay. Um, remember when you're my age, you've gotta be able to look back at the actions that you've taken in business and you've gotta be proud of them. It's not easy when you're your age thinking that because you've got 30 years of fight ahead of you in business. Okay, and you're gonna go through some pretty tough battles in that fight. And you may take prisons and you may not, but you will fight because you're not sure you're tenacious. You are gonna fight your corner. Okay? And I guess the reason I think I've got the best job in talk talk today is because I work with people and I trust people and people trust me for 20, 30 years. And those people are still with us today, or many of them are still with us today. And the principle I've always had is that someone told me this when very early on in business is don't do somebody down just because you can. And in business, there will be opportunities where you can steal an angle on somebody, okay, because of the position that you're in. Right? But don't do it just because you can do it. If you do have to fight somebody, fight them for good reason, but don't do them just because you can fight and you're bigger than them. It's a bit like bullying in the playground. Yeah? Because in business, you do get a chance to screw people, you know, but don't, you know, if you need to screw somebody to make a living, you start it the wrong business, because you're not adding value, right? And that's where you end up in countries where there's a lot of corruption, where a lot of businesses exist through corruption, 
than that. And you don't want to be in that position because you will end up looking back in 30 years' time and not perhaps feeling good. Because, you know, recession for me is when I can't afford four pints of bitter on a Friday night. The, the, the downside of that is when I was your age, I had a six pint, I had a six pint stomach and a four pint pocket. And the problem now is I've got four pint, <laughs> four pint stomach and six pint pocket. So, you know, when you do look back, make sure um, you, you know that, that, that you feel good about about the actions you've taken. And, and, and of course, when you've made some money, it's actually payback time, which is why I'm stood here talking to you because you're going to have to sit here talk to people that is busy time. But that was, that was the end of that, but I've got to say a few things about starting a business in Manchester. Um, because hopefully, when you graduate, you will decide to start your business in Manchester. Manchester is a fantastic place to start a business, and you will likely to find anywhere better in the UK. And if people say London's better or Cambridge is better, they may, might not be right. There is a lot going on in Manchester. Tremendous skill base. You know, there's lots of space. We've got incubator space. And, even in the university, you know, we've got incubator space, and there's loads of it around Manchester. Um, and the cost of that space is a fraction of what you will pay in London and Cambridge. You've got a lot of like-minded people to find your partners and people to work with. Um, there's a lot of capital. There's a lot of business angels, people who've made money or come and check out some cash. Um, there's a lot of small corporate finance houses, and there's business growth funds. There's lots of access to capital, small and large. We've got large corporate finances as well. We've got good lawyers in town, got good finance people in town. You know. um, the uni's got a really big part to play in, in that whole place because of the technology that's coming out, the quality of the graduates produced, and of course the youth. You're at that right age where businesses get started. The bite size training from the, the Enterprise Centre are really important. Great transport links. Um, you know, the staff retention in Manchester is the best in our group. Our group, we, we run the technology division in, in um, 10 miles west of here, and it's got the highest retention of staff in the entire group, and it's got the highest intellectual capacity in the, the entire group, and it's got the lowest cost compared to running it. You're in a much better place growing a business in the northwest than you will be in Shoreditch, and, and, and certainly the, the in Cambridge. And, um, and that's it. Wow. Neil? <laughs> definition for an entrepreneur, you get really frustrated with process. Um, actually, of course, process is out of place. And I'm an engineer, and I know if I don't go through process, I can't achieve things. I wrote the company's first quality assurance manual, and it, it killed me, uh, having to document how to do things. But actually, as you employ more people, unless you have process and structure, you know, chaos, yeah. chaos will absolutely ensue. And of course, it's finding that balance, and always ask yourself, if I make this process, does it add value? If it doesn't add value, don't do it. Just because somebody says that's the way you should do it, think about it. Is that adding value to our business? And value might be it reduces risk, financial risk, safety risk. You know, it might make things more efficient. Great. You know, it might protect us against financial irregularities. Great. If it adds value, fine, do it. Make it fit for purpose. Processes change. Don't make processes irksome just because you've got consultants in that's good at building irks and processes. And as your company gets bigger, boy, all your processes get irks. Our chairman is, um, is, is legendary at, at sort of completely ignoring processes. We all diligently do things, and then the chairman says, nah, do that. Do it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and providing you stay on, on not getting business, of course, the only thing you want to respect is the law of the land. You know, you don't, you're not like a government agency where you've got to be a bit more sensitive to things. Obviously, you get bigger, you've got to respect 
the opinion of your customers because you might end up on Watchdog or in the newspaper. <laughs> so you have, you've got more of a value to it, so fit for purpose. So let's have a hand up for a question. So who brings the X Factor to talk talk then now? <laughs> yeah, of course. Is we, it you? We, we who brings the text? Who we, brings the X Factor to talk talk? We sponsor, People, your we sponsor, ideas. <laughs> yeah. We sponsor X Factor. It's a shocking program. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we give them 10 million quid a year to sponsor that program. But our sales go like this because our customers watch X Factor. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there a question? Help me, help me. I'm going to go for the person closest to my legs. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I, I just heard about uh, the topic you you were talking about the partnership fail uh, in statistics. I, I just wondering, as far as I am concerned, if I want to make a business, I will choose my friend as a partnership at the beginning. So how how do you make a balance between the uh, personal relationship and the enterprise? Uh, if we, if you're working with your friends. Uh, it's, it's a very good question, it's the, the one I cautioned on, on the partnership, okay? My business partner, Graham Chisnell, is actually now my lifelong friend. And we are friends, you know, our family are friends, our wives are friends, our kids are friends, in fact, two of our kids are in business together. That is incredibly unusual. The chances are you're going to fall out with your friends. Statistically, you will fall out with your friends. So if you really want to, if you really, <laughs> you really like your friend that much, then you need to change your business plan. Um, but that's not going to happen. You're going to start your business with whoever you want to start your business with. And in a way, if you drift apart after X years and, you, and the business has been successful and, and, and your friend goes off to do something and you do something else, so you get new business partners, um, and, and you still remain friends, that's equally a win. Okay. But you know, there will be really challenged times when you think right and he thinks, or she thinks left, and you've got to make that decision, you know, and that's why I was saying, pick the hills to fight on, don't squabble over small things, make sure you're strategic, not tactical at the right time. But you, you know, you will fall out with your business partner over things. I, in fact, the, the, the biggest single route I had with my business partner was before we started the business at the beer cafe in Manchester over a girl. So we've got through 30 years of not having a real big bum fight, but we've both seen the bigger picture. And when we've not agreed, we've agreed to disagree and we'll figure it out, we'll come back. And sometimes we've gone and got help. We've gone and got small consultants to come into the business to try and unscramble relationships between us, other directors. And when you're small and there's, particularly when there's six or seven of you and you've got all the skills coming in and you haven't got 30 years on the clock, right? you, you, you need that kind of help. These days, I, I just like, boom, knock a few heads together, you know. It's a bit easier, but in those days, we, have, we used to go get external help. So it's a challenge. Be careful. Okay, next question. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay, uh, you mentioned that in business, people, people and people are very important. And um, when it comes to people, I think in terms of personality, generally you have the introverts and the extroverts. Yeah. And Susan, Susan King said that, said that there's no correlation between the best ideas and the best doctor. So my question is, how do you bring the best out of introverts? <laughs> okay, uh, do you think I'm an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, extrovert? Since you're an engineer, I think it's mostly an introvert. I'm an engineer, extrovert. so... Uh, uh, I, I don't think people describe me as being introverted, but that actually makes me quite a strange engineer, funny enough, because engineers generally are yeah, like, sure. quite introverted, because they're very cautious people. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert in your head, believe me, trust me. Um, but um, look, the business needs all types of skills. You know, you don't want your introverts running the sales department, for sure. Okay? But you certainly want them running, you know, um, you, know you, want them, you possibly want them running some aspects of finance control. You know, uh, you want them running, um, I, I guess once you've got the processes working such that you've built the machine that works, you can have progressively more introverted people running process for a mature business activity. But if you're trying to do any kind of new activity and you're trying to figure your way through is it a business, is it not a business, you're definitely better off with the um, extroverted people. But eventually that's going to run into, in, you into trouble. And you recall that I said that I could not be the CEO of our company? And that's because I, my attention to detail would not satisfy that. 
the requirements that a CEO has to satisfy to be FTSE, uh, FTSE 250. I sort of, I would say I don't treat governance with respect, but I certainly push the boundaries of governance. Okay, Sean Miller? Yes, I've got one here, and one over there. Neil, we're waiting. Is business an art or a science? Cool. Um, I'm sort of a difficult question. No, it's an art. It's got to be an art, isn't it? Yeah. It's got to be an art. I mean, yeah. you might use science within business, but that's definitely. That's okay. why, which is why MBS, of course, is in humanities. Yeah, because, oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, being a student can often be a struggle, especially financially. Um, and so, financial capitalists are a great way to get products and help your businesses, but, however, obviously they're quite competitive. So, what are the alternatives, firstly, to venture capitalists? And, secondly, uh, if you are to go ahead with one, how do you know you're getting the best value from them? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, you've put a lot of effort into starting your business. The very, very last thing that will be on your mind is parting with equity in your business to a third party. And it took us a long, long time before we would part with equity in the business. But it took us 15 years to build the business. So if you're going on a slow burn like we did, where we use retain profits to grow the business, your business is going to grow slower. You also might start a business that's got very high capital requirements, and that's not an option. So you need capitalizing. At the point you're bringing capital into your business, you've got to think very, very hard about do I dilute my equity, okay, and bring that capital in with a view to growing the business faster. And I'd say to you, this for the first 15 years, we didn't do that because we were in a type of business that didn't lend itself to. But once we got into telecoms, you can't grow a telecoms business without vast amounts of capital. And, and when we'd start the telecoms business, we went to uh, it's two joint ventures. The first one I described was with a sales company, and that took the business from 15 million to 100 million in 18 months, two years. It was so successful, it was untrue. And then the next one is we took it into Carcom with, with Charles D, and, um, and that took the, the business to where it is, is today. Um, and, and we diluted. So we, at that point, you know, I'm a small shareholder relative to what it used to be, um, but I'm a lot wealthier because the growth of that, that, that was the right time to dilute and take the chips off the table. Second part of the question is picking your, 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 your equity partner because these days for you guys banks are out of the question, you know, they lost the plot as you know a few years ago. So you, you're looking at uh, uh, whether it's angel financing or equity financing and you do want to do a bit of a roadshow because you're looking for somebody who understands the type of business you're going into. So if you're in tech, find somebody who knows how to invest in tech. If you're in biotech, find somebody who understands biosciences. You know, don't find somebody who's good invest in retail. You know, it's, you have to put a lot of effort in. Look, there's a lot of choice out there. And if you, in, the, in the Manchester, if you go to the growth company, they'll give you some advice. Or if you speak to us, we'll probably help the point you might rush you But you, you, it's a very good question, and you do have to think. But there does come a time when you probably do have to dive in, because I've met a lot of entrepreneurs that have never sold a single share in their business to anybody. And they run very, most, the vast majority of them run very nice small businesses. Now, and of course, there has to come a time where you've got to get your equity out. You've got to be, you've got to be an exit strategy. So you don't want to start a business thinking, I'm going to, unless you do want to start a business thinking, I'm going to hand this on to my children. You know, you've got to be thinking, what's my exit strategy? And of course, it might be a flotation, it might be a private equity investment, you know. So there'll come time, eventual times, where you can take some chips off the table. And we did that a few times. Take a few chips off the table, pay off the mortgage, roll the dice. You know, it's a personal thing, I know, but it's a very, very good question, one well worth everybody thinking about. Let's take one last question. There is some catering for everybody, um, just down the corridor. Um, and we could probably hang on to Neil for a little bit longer if people want to kind of grab him and ask, ask, ask a good question. So let's just take one public question. And then let's say thanks very much and um, and good night and go get the catering. So one last question. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry, everyone. I've been trying to keep track of you all. Hi. Um, you mentioned about um, having to, if you work in a different country or different um, place, and how to get more of like um, um, laws and people and lawyers and things like that. And um, if if your venture is a country whereby you're going to well, the norm there is to be then that. Do you stick to your rules and say no? Or do you have to kind of like pay up that person to get your stuff going and then when you set to them and say, okay, you know what, we're not going to be like that. Or do you go from the beginning to a new market and say, it's not happening. We're bringing the procedural and we're good models from, uh, from the UK to a different country and we don't bribe people, we don't, you know, go around them. Then. 
as well. Do you have kind of at some point you say, you know what, let's just get inside and then we can. Um, the answer to this question really is go and keep your eyes open because I'm not saying don't go to another company and trade and if UK is the only place to be. Because what UK law has done and uh, an enterprise in the UK has done has made this an almost perfect market. So actually, running a business in the UK is actually quite a challenge because there's a, a lot of people want to do it here because we've got great legal systems and financial systems and availability of capital and lots of tech skills and most of it. Um, of course, there might, there's lots of countries with loads of opportunity and there's lots of listed companies in London that, that go off, you know, exploring for oil and, and, and minerals around the world and take huge risks. But they understand the country's risks that they're working in. So if you're going to start a business in a, in a foreign country, you know, really understand the, the aspects of, of not, perhaps, sorry, I'm talking about a country that's not, you know, not one you've grown up in, perhaps, or a different country, where you think, oh, there's an opportunity there. You've got to really, really understand the culture and the finances. And uh, we got an opportunity to invest in India not that long ago. And, uh, and our finance director said, you must be joking. We haven't got a cat in hell's chance of running our business in India. We just, we don't understand the market, we don't understand the corruption, you know, and it's just so corrupt. Right? But that means that market's imperfect, and the people who are working in it actually make quite a lot of money. But that's not where we want to be, and we would never win. The playing field wasn't level enough for us. I don't think the playing field is level enough in France for a British company, personally. So you're not going to find me going off too far off case, you know. It's, it's a real choice. Understand the market. Go in with your eyes open and make sure you understand the market if you go off case. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, there's food yep. and. Just get on and do it. Just absolutely. JFDI. <laughs>